I know every week I've been starting by saying I was thinking about this topic and I would share my thoughts. Um, but uh, this is a heavy one, even as we were preparing and having discussions. Uh, it was quite a heavy subject. And I thought about it and my life and why this topic is very important, if you would allow me to share a little bit. And it reminded me of one time I was out of the country working overseas and I was in prayer and, and, and fasting and I remember one morning I just fell down in so much pain because a memory came back to me. And this was a memory of my uncle who had molested me. And at this time, I had taken time off from everything. And God was telling me that he was preparing me for leadership. And one of the things God told me is that I had to heal. In the eyes of people, I was very successful. I was in a country courtesy of a president. I had worked on so many campaigns and never lost an election. Uh, but God stopped me and said there are issues that need to heal. And he told me one day that uh, in a few days, a certain, some memories will come uh, back to you and you have to go through it and heal. It was the most painful memory in my life. And I asked God why he brought back that memory. And he told me that healed people heal others. And because of what he did, I may have forgotten, but it changed who I was and it shaped how I saw men, the kind of leader that I was, and also the kind of Christian that I was and the relationship that I had with God. And one of the things was even how I began to see women and have some ideas. I'm sharing this to tell you that as we're listening to the people who are going to speak to us today, let's not think about pointing fingers, let's check ourselves. And one of the things God reminded me as I had to face this issue with my family, which was difficult, he asked me to do it because he said when it comes to sexual issues, there's a lot of shame. And he reminded me that shame comes from the devil. The first time we see shame, is when Adam and Eve sinned, and that is when the snake had just come. So we're going to discuss this topic without shame. We are going to look at ourselves without shame because God is producing great leaders in this room. And we purpose to leave this room having done a surgery on ourselves and having healed. So let's have a raw topic and open up to what God is about to do today. Dr. Kuria, sorry, not Dr. Kuria. <laughs> Dr. Wahome, that's a, that's a prophetic word. <laughs> but Dr. Wahome, um, I'll not focus so much uh, at the beginning on um, you know, gay and LGBT, but I want to ask you, what is authentic sexuality and how, how does it tie up with this topic? Uh, well, thank you very much. And, and that is always a good place to start mm. uh, because with this topic, there is a lot of confusion and a lot of uh, deception. And if we are not careful as a body of Christ, then it becomes divisive. Now, Authentic sexuality then would be the purpose uh, that God intended with our sexuality. And um, if we go back to the book of Genesis, then God created us um, in his own image and likeness. And therefore, the first thing we have as human beings is that in us, we have goodness, we have truth, and we have love. And any time we are to experience the fullness of our sexuality, then those three must come to play. So we must focus on goodness, the truth, and love. Now, um, we were also, uh, the mo the, of those three, love then is the most critical. And we need to share with the world our understanding of love. Because love is a small word that has really been abused. 
And the best way to understand love then is see it from the creator himself. Mm -hmm. So he uh, sent his own son to die on the cross for us, despite the fact that we had sinned and disobeyed him. So he sacrificially gives himself to us. Yes. So that as we receive him, then we get redemption. And that is what love is. And Christ exemplified that love. Mm -hmm. So if I am to truly love God, then I am to sacrificially give myself to Christ so that then I can become an instrument of God's purpose in my life. And if I am to love my neighbor, then I am to sacrificially give myself to my neighbor so that they know God, they know Christ, and they too can receive redemption. Mm -hmm. So that is our understanding of love. Then he created us male-female for companionship. And he created the male-female before he instituted uh, marriage. So companionship, we need to live in a community. It cannot be just about me. I can hurt people by the way I behave. And then he instituted marriage. And in marriage, he brings the man and woman together and establishes a family. And it is in marriage that then we are to experience our sexuality in completeness. If you look at the male and the female organs, they do not make sense to us. Yes. So my whatever is only good for going to the bathroom. But in the presence of a woman and with the organs that she has, then it becomes a system that can deliver seed. Yes. And through that seed, we can actually get fruitfulness and get a child. And the woman's organs are able to uh, actually incubate this child deliver this child and delivery is also very important because you only deliver that which is not yours so whatever the woman carried belonged to god and when she's finished the incubation process she delivers that child so that we can bring up that child to the fullness of the knowledge of god so that they can too become an instrument of god's purpose so our sexual organs then are very vital in that core uh, uh, procreation, being co-creators with God to bring in new life. Outside of marriage, they do not make sense. Within marriage, they make sense. And that is authentic sexuality. So the opposite then, or broken sexuality, would be anything that is different from what God intended. So if I reject my biological sex, then I am saying God was wrong in creating me male. If I reject the fact that there is, it's necessary to have a male-female relationship in marriage, then I reject what God has designed. If I use my organs in the wrong way, then I reject what God has designed. And if I'm not careful to watch what my thought processes are, then I'll be inclined to sin. So all that from what we think, what we watch, what we listen to, and then how we respond to those stimulus and whether we respect the institution of marriage and marriage within, uh, uh, and sex within marriage, then we're described as whether we are living an authentic sexuality or a broken sexuality. Mm -hmm. you've, you've taken back to you know, proper schooling um, and even your definition, truly God is love and looking at our organs and ourselves as uh, in a completely different way. How would you then define a gay person? Um, the term gay or the term homosexual is a self-label. Mm. And any good Christian should not use that term or should avoid using it. If you look at me and you don't know me, and you call me gay or homosexual, then you have judged me because you do not know the truth. However, if I come up to you and I say I am gay or I am homosexual, then I have self-confessed my brokenness. And if we discuss that topic going forwards, then I am no longer judging you because you are the one who has labeled yourself. The next thing is, it is very important then to find out how do you understand that term. If you come to me and you say, I am gay, then the first question I'll ask you is, 
what do you mean? And Christians, this is where it begins. What do you mean? The word has been used two different ways. One way is, I am attracted to people of the same sex. So I am battling an attraction to people of the same sex. Now, if that is the truth, nobody would know in this congregation who is gay and who is not. Is that true? Now, the second way it has been used is that I am in sexual relationships with people of the same sex. True? Mm -hmm. Those two are very different when it comes to what we should do about it as Christians. Because if what I am battling with is an attraction to people of the same sex, then even me as Wahome, I'm battling with attraction to people of opposite sex. I am married, but I'll still see a beautiful woman, isn't it? Mm. And I would feel attracted to her. That is not sin. The question is, what do you do with that attraction? Do you pursue it to the point that you're now having a sexual and erotic thoughts about that person, in which case it would be sin? Or have you pursued that person to the point where you, you instigate a sexual relationship, in which case it would be sin? So if one says they are gay, then it is very important for us to know where they are at. If it is the attraction, it is the same like the one we are battling with. We are all battle with the flesh. It is not unique, but we know what God says about our sexuality. He says we must not engage in sexual thought, we must not engage in sex outside of marriage, and marriage is male-female. So that's where the catch is. What do you mean? If I am in a sexual relationship with people of the same sex, then I am broken, and I am doing what is wrong, as same as a fellow who is committing adultery, same as the fellow who is committing any other sexual sin. And we know that we need to come back to Christ. We need to come and confess our sin. We need to ask for forgiveness. And we need to go and apologize to those who we have wounded through our behavior. And then we receive our redemption. Mm. Dr. Wahome, you've mentioned brokenness uh, and gay a number of times. Is one born gay or is there something that happens, brokenness in their life, um, that changes them? Okay, another good question. Remember that sexual, uh, uh, what we call spiritual mm -hmm. brokenness always comes before uh, mental and physical brokenness. Now, the, nobody is born gay. There is no gay gene. In fact, the study that has been done for genes uh, found some 6,500 different genes between men and women. And most of the people who end up with same-sex attraction or same-sex relationships usually have a very, very traumatic experience somewhere in their life, usually in childhood. And the majority of them uh, have suffered either abuse, it could be physical, it could be emotional, and that can sometimes be so deep that they cannot remember what happened to them, and some of them would confess to having been born that way. But uh, I'll give you two examples of, of gay people, um, let's say, um, of men who I know who have engaged in same-sex relationships who have come to me as we walked th through this journey. One of them um, uh, was a, a, th a 30, 35, 36 years old executive. And uh, he told me he was born 10 years after their last child in that family. And the father was very annoyed that that child came. He felt the child came when he was supposed to be retiring and resting and enjoying himself and he consistently told that boy that you came to mess up my life. You are, you are useless, you came to mess up my life, and that was his relationship with his father. He felt rejected, he felt a lot of pain. And to make matters worse, when he was uh, in standard five, four or five, the father sent him to a boarding school. 
just to stay away from him and would not go to visit the child uh, during the breaks. And that was his life. And somewhere in Standard 7, um, an older boy started uh, being very friendly to him and would go and sit with him. So he was a lonely boy, broken self-esteem. And uh, this guy would keep going to him and would hold him and would encourage him and would chat with him. And eventually he felt that finally there is somebody who cares about me. And eventually that older boy seduced him. And he thought, if I refuse, I am going to lose even this one. And that is how he got involved. Now, the problem with the male and the way we are designed is that if you stimulate the prostate, if you, when, when we go to the doctors to be examined, whether our prostate is enlarged or not, uh, the doctor puts a finger through the anus and you can actually reach the prostate gland and you can examine it and feel whether it is enlarged or, or sick. Now, when you stimulate, if you were to rub that prostate, then the man would actually get an ejaculation. So when men learn to have sex through the anus, then they actually get a sexual release, which can become addictive. And some of them, when they don't get men to have sex with, actually resort to masturbation to get that release. So it becomes an issue. And you find that uh, when he left that school and went to high school, he himself now would seduce other boys and get engaged in that. And it was not until much later that he was struggling with that, that he came out um, through a, a men's ministry we have at the church, and we were able to start the journey with him. The second one was um, he was abused sexually by his father when he was four years old. And by the time he was six or seven, he had actually learned to enjoy that experience and would go to his father and instigate it. By the time uh, he was about 12, the father felt that this was wrong and he decided to end the relationship and told the young man that it can't continue anymore. And the way he received it was rejection. He felt he had been rejected and he felt that um, now the father doesn't love him anymore and he went out and started going into bars and seducing men and he ended up in, in, in um, homosexual uh, prostitution. And uh, he later came to Christ and understood that what had happened to him was actually wrong. And when we were talking, he would say, sometimes I would think it is wrong, but then I'd imagine it is my father. My father would not do to me what is not wrong, what is not right. And therefore, he would convince himself that daddy knows what is good and wrong, and therefore what he is doing cannot be, cannot be wrong. Now, one more of a, of a lady who became a transgender, this one is in the US. Um, they were playing in the park with a brother, and two men came and took them into a public toilet, and they raped the little girl. But they did not rape the boy. They did not touch the boy. And so, as she was growing up, she thought that the reason I suffered is because I'm not a boy. And from that point, she started identifying as a boy. And that is how she became a transgender male. So, those are the kind of things that we have. So, any time we meet someone who identifies as gay or homosexual, then it is very important to, to understand that just like one who is struggling with adulterous relationships is what happened to you. Usually there is some woundedness. If we find somebody who is um, what people call prostitutes, then you talk to them, you find there is woundedness. Something happened to them that destroyed them and destroyed their spiritual life and we need to correct all that before we can deal with the mental issues. Thank you, Dr. I can hear people just saying, but the good thing with being open is we begin to understand some of these issues and even have less fear. L let me come to you. I baptized you, Dr. Doc also, doctor. <laughs> but Kuria, um, let's, let's look at media where a lot of times this topic is discussed uh, much more uh, openly. What do you think... Uh, 
what role has media played when it comes uh, to this topic and even how has it shaped our pers uh, perspective when it comes to um, gay, the gay right movement? Uh, first up, good morning Nairobi Chapel. Simni Salimi Tafadali. Good morning, Nairobi Chapel. Good morning. It's, uh, it's a bit cold in this place, is it? The weather or the topic? I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> but uh, first up, I really wanted to applaud you for your, for your openness and honesty. Um, I, I think it, it's, it takes a lot to come to a platform like this and just be open. Can we celebrate her for her? I really felt like uh, we should have taken a moment there just to celebrate that. Now, thank you for the question. Um, as so, so for me, I come at this whole conversation uh, from a media and from a narrative uh, perspective. Uh, as Pastor Nick introduced me, I love media, I love the intersection of church and culture, and I've studied um, you know, media and media trends to be able to get a sense of how have we reached the place where we have reached from a media uh, perspective. Now, I'm going to start 100 years ago. Is that okay if I go back that far? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go about 100 years ago, and I'm going to talk about the gay rights uh, movement and advocacy and the journey that they have come through from the 1920s until today. I'll do it quickly, don't worry. So, so this, this is really what happens. It's about the 1920s, the, the, about 100 years ago, that uh, the gay rights movement kind of begins to organize itself as a movement. Now, back then, obviously, they were a very fringe movement, but what their strategy was for many decades was actually uh, picketing and trying to influence government policy. So through the 20s, the 30s, they were very unsuccessful with this, but their, what they attempted to do was influence government through policy. Now, that went on for many years. A couple of critical breakthroughs happened around the 70s, just before, just before the 70s and just after the 70s, but in that, uh, in that uh, you know, time, time span. The first thing that happened that accelerated their conversation happened in 1969. And I do need to give a disclaimer that a lot of this narrative comes from North America because that's where the, this movement, the gay rights movement, has really been led from. But secondly, also because they're the dominant culture of maybe the past hundred years or so. So what happens in 1969, in a, a little village called Greenwich Village in New York, there's a pub called Stonewall Inn. And what used to happen at the time is that the police used to come and raid pubs, especially gay pubs. And the reason for that is because they were very closely attached to the mafia of the day. And you can read this if you just Google gay mafia, and I'll tell you a bit more about that. And they were raiding clubs regularly. This one day in 1969 when they raided Stonewall Inn, something happened that had never happened before, and the people in the club and the community began to fight back. Usually the police would come and quickly disperse them, and that was that. But this time they had had it, and they, were, they, were, they began to fight back. And if you Google something called the Stonewall Riots of 1969 across New York and a couple of other cities in North America, what began to happen is riots happened, and this began to galvanize a movement. The movement now began to come together and feel like, you know, we have a common enemy, so we need to band together a little bit closer. That's the first thing that happened in 1969. Towards the end of the 1970s, and into uh, the early 1980, 8081, a disease came and began to wipe out a huge section of the gay community in North America. And this became a huge uh, public health uh, issue. This disease initially was known as GRID. GRID was the gay rights immune deficiency. It took another year or two before the medical uh, field began to realize that this disease, even though it was wiping out big sections of homosexual people, was also affecting heterosexual people. And they renamed the disease as AIDS. So you may not know this, but AIDS was initially called GRID, Gay-Related Immune Deficiency. Now, why that's critical in this conversation is because, again, 
this began to galvanize the movement. It began to bring the movement together because they were under pressure, not just from the authorities, from Stonewall, but now also as a public health issue. It began to galvanize the movement. A third thing happened in the early 1980s, and this was really the straw that broke the camel's back. There's a, 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 a newspaper in New York known as the New York Post, still in existence today. In the early 1980s, must have been 1983, 84, they published an article that was extremely, extremely critical of gays and lesbians. And you, you, you have to think about this with 1980 eyes. We don't have internet, you know, we don't have a hundred channels on television, so we are very reliant on newspapers. Mm. And this thing really spread like wildfire. This is what New York Post has said about us. Now, those three things began to galvanize the gay rights movement more than anything else. And in 1985, a big breakthrough happened for the gay rights movement. An organization that became, later, later became known as GLAAD, G-L-A-A-D, and you can see it up on the screen. It stands for the Gay and Lesbian uh, uh, Alliance Against Defamation was formed. Now for me as a media practitioner, as I have followed this organization, I, I see this sometimes in Christian gatherings and people want to kick me out. I am extremely jealous of this organization and the work that they have done. GLAD is the, uh, is the uh, media advocate, the key media advocate for the gay and lesbian uh, movement. And that they were formed in retaliation to this New York Post article because they said, listen, if, if the media are beginning to paint us this way, we must begin to fight back. Now, if you remember what I said, the 1920s, moving on, their key thing was picketing and impacting government policy. In the 80s, they changed, and they began to realize the person who impacts or influences public opinion the most yeah. is not the government. Mm. Who is it? Media. It's the media. And they began to invest extremely heavily in the media, disproportionately to the size of the community. A second thing rose along with GLAD. A thing that was pejoratively known as the gay mafia or the Velvet Mafia. Again, you can read this. These things are available. You can write, write them down and go Google them. It was a negative term, but what began to happen is that the gay movement began to, to, to identify certain critical areas of media that they had to begin to influence and influence very, very strongly. Film, television, uh, music, advertising, and social media. Those are the five things that they have began to impact very significantly from 1985 to date. Uh, they began to invest heavily in Hollywood, in producers, in directors, in writers, and this is who was known as the Velvet Mafia. Again, a negative term. They didn't identify themselves with that term. Their first big breakthrough was a television show. I don't know if you remember this show, Will and Grace. Anyone remember Will and Grace? Yeah. Any dinosaurs here remember Will and Grace? <laughs> All right, so Will and Grace, I think it's up on the screen, was the first big breakthrough that they had. It's the first time they were able to position a gay couple within mainstream television. And you can see a quote there, just put it back up. A quote by the then US Vice President that says, I don't have it on my notes, but he says, I think Will and Grace, I can't even read it, but you can read it. He's really saying that this is probably the most critical uh, show in, in, in the gay rights movement at the time. From there, they began to get some really, really big breakthroughs within Hollywood. There was a big movie known as Philadelphia. Anyone remember Philadelphia? Yeah. Okay, I'm going quite far back. <laughs> Philadelphia, Tom Hanks, Denzel Washington, big Hollywood blockbuster, Oscar award-winning movie. Uh, that was another big breakthrough. Since then, they have had multiple breakthroughs. There's a movie called Milk. Anyone know Milk? The story of Harvey Milk, a US lawyer. Mm. Uh, there's also the movie, what's the next one there? There's also the movie uh, Brokeback Mountain. Anyone yeah. know that one? Yes. And my point here is this, is that this is the journey that the gay rights movement has gone through from a media perspective and a narrative perspective 
from influencing policy and government to realizing that media are the people who need to be influenced and beginning to invest literally millions of dollars so that they can, uh, they can change perceptions. I'll say one last thing, I know I've spoken for a minute. Mm -hmm. I'll say one last thing. One of the things that they helped craft, which I thought was absolutely brilliant, and this is the part where I say as a media practitioner, these guys have run by far the world's best perception change uh, advocacy movement the world has ever seen. If you watch a sitcom, you watch a movie, if you watch a, a, a thing on television, and you see a gay person, what are the characteristics of that person? I'll tell you some and tell me if you identify with them. Very stylish. Mm -hmm. True? Yep. Very stylish. Uh, great cook. A girl's uh, best friend. Girls, I was just, it was on the tip of my tongue. Yeah. A girl's best friend. Yes. And, and there's, there are certain characteristics. Now, you may think that this is all incidental. It isn't. This is crafted. There's a very, very specific narrative that has been crafted about how we want to be seen. Now, am I saying that gay people are not those things? I'm sure there are those who are. But it doesn't, it doesn't represent the entire spectrum. And they began to impact Hollywood television, music. If you know people like David Foster, you know David Foster, a big music writer. If you know people like Clive Davis, mm. you can look them up. They became key advocates to begin to impact and influence the narrative within media and within Hollywood. Yes, but is media being influenced or is, it, is media just reflecting what is going on in our society? It's, it's a great question, and I get that question frequently when I have this conversation. Is it just, is, is media just a reflection? 1969, there's a gentleman called Eric Clark who came up with a really interesting theory. It's called the theory of racial representation. Uh, sorry, my, racial, uh, minority representation. And what, what he posited was this. He said that on, on, in media, minority groups go through four phases uh, in as far as media is concerned. The first phase is um, refusal or non-recognition. Again, you can look this up. Um, and what he says is that minority groups start by being completely ignored by the media. So if you think about people living with albinism, for instance, that's the stage they really are at. They're not represented. You don't see them in the media frequently. Then you move to your next phase uh, after uh, refusal, which is um, ridicule. Ridicule is the phase now where you will see people become the butt of jokes. So African Americans went through this, where you know they were painted a certain way with black face, big lips, yeah. big bums, and things like that. The gay movement as well, where they became the butt of every joke. So you enter public consciousness, but in a very negative way. Then you move to recognition, where the media begins to realize that, mm. hey, we need to recognize these guys. They're actually pretty significant but we need to manage the narrative. So African Americans again went through this, where they went from being represented ridiculously as you know, gang bangers and drug dealers, and Hollywood began to, to in a sense, uh, rehabilitate that in that season, where if you think about it, if you watch movies a lot, you'll see a lot of African Americans, especially in a certain season, who are in, in law enforcement as police officers and things like that. Watch a lot of Denzel Washington movies, Will Smith and things like that. That's the stage of recognition where they begin to, to in a sense, rehabilitate your, you know, how media sees you. The final stage is respect. And respect now is where we respect you enough for you to be able to create your own narrative and tell your own story. Now, the reason I tell us about this theory is this. There's never been a single movement in the history of the world that has gone through these four phases within two generations. Yeah. There's none. I'll tell you today, uh, the women's rights movement has not reached there. Mm. And it's a much older movement, represents 50% of the global population of the world. Haven't reached there yet. There are many minorities, people living with disabilities, with albinism, uh, you know, Asian Americans and so on and so forth, Mexicans, Russians, who have never even, with all their investment, haven't reached there. The reality is that, is that there, there's literally millions of dollars being pumped into this thing. 
If you take a look at something like Netflix, uh, for instance, um, you know, television, especially in the past 10, 10, 15 years, has been used very, very heavily. Uh, Glad, one of the things they have is a thing they call the where we are at report. And you can, you can again Google this thing, where they talk about where are we at in terms of media and representation uh, on all these different, the five platforms that I mentioned earlier. So they track those. There's a graph, I don't know if you have that graph, that, that shows over the past uh, about 12 to 15 years, the growth of what they call um, recurring characters within television who are gay and lesbian that has steadily increased and risen through the years. Glad what they have done is that they keep track of this and they put immense pressure on television networks. Netflix is probably the biggest one that is being used in our generation. Yeah. I'll close with a story. I know I've spoken for a long time. My mouth is even dry. Forgive me. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll close with one, one last one here. And I'll say, anyone know the, the series Designated Survivor? Come on, Chapel. You guys don't just watch the Jesus film. You guys know it. <laughs> so I used to watch this series. This series was on what was called free-to-air or broadcast television. And then at some point, the, the network that ran the series said to themselves, this thing is not profitable, doesn't have enough views, and they dumped it. It went silent for a period and then came back on television. And I began watching this series again, and immediately I felt, hey, something is wrong with this series. Mm -hmm. the, the language, they began cursing, it's different. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, there are random uh, LGBT characters who don't impact the story in any way. And it's only when I looked, when I researched and I realized, these guys moved from broadcast television to Netflix. And the thing about Netflix, unlike, say, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, Apple TV, all these streaming sites, the thing about them is that unlike broadcast television that's reliant on advertisers, you know, advertisers are very wary of scandal. They're very wary of scandal. Uh, uh, streaming television doesn't rely on advertisers, it relies on subscribers. And as a result, you know, the bar is set so much lower. And many platforms now are being influenced very, very heavily with this narrative. I know I've spoken for a long time. I have many more things to say, but let me, let me <laughs> I, hand it actually, back. Actually, uh, Kuria, you know, for a lot of us, we are learning. We are learning. We are relearning. I can see people are nodding. We are learning, relearning, hence the silence. I guess also a lot of aha moments. But also it's quite interesting to see that uh, all this is intentional. Everything Very I'm watching on TV, they're not just making sales. There's a narrative out there um, that, is, we are being, that is, we are being taught uh, how to look at uh, this Absolutely. issue of, of gay and, and lesbian. And let me come back to you, Dr. Tari. It's important that we realize there's a narrative um, that is being sold out there. So maybe it's time for us to even relearn a few things. At the beginning, I asked you who is gay um, so that we can begin to relearn that. But also, uh, what is the LGBTQ uh, community? Um, again, thank you very much. I I'd like uh, us to look at the LGBT community as we look at the church. It is um, a group that has come together, has identified certain values, has identified certain characteristics, and uh, has certain things that they believe very strongly. It's an ideology, it's a culture. They have definitions that they hold and they sell to governments and to the UN, and it's a whole uh, movement. Now, um, if you are struggling with same-sex attraction, and you googled same-sex attraction, I can assure you, you will not go to a Christian site. True? Mm -hmm. You will probably land at one of the sites of the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. And then they'll give you a definition. This is what you are. And then you are one of us. This is, you know, you, you are welcome to join us and stuff. So it is a movement, and it is actually a small part of a bigger group that is called the Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights Movement. That's really the, the elephant. And um, they have um, a curriculum 
that is used to again push their narrative and to recruit that is called the comprehensive sexuality education curriculum that they have been able to influence uh, as, as Kuria is saying into the UN, into UN documents and it comes back into um, countries as, as, uh, as UN policy, UN um, instigated changes. So it's a, it's a culture change, um, it's a culture change movement. Now it is based on the, what is called the sexual revolution that goes back to the French Revolution. Uh, where there was a complete overturn of the, uh, the, the way the, the world related. Uh, the church was um, the first, what you'd call the first estate, then the, royal, the royalty, and then there were the others in, 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 in European history. But in the French Revolution, the church uh, was overturned and the royalty came above. And from that point, there's been a huge movement from Europe that is anti church anti-Christian. So the sexual reproductive, uh, the, the, the sexual revolution had several things uh, that they would say and say repeatedly. One is that you are abnormal if you are not having sex. Uh, and that was aimed principally at the bishops and the nuns who are in the Catholic Church. Uh, the other thing is that um, marriage is not necessary and in fact it should be removed. Uh, that same-sex relationships uh, should be normalized, uh, that um, uh, gay marriages, uh, or as they are called, uh, gay unions, uh, should be legalized, and that everybody should be taught to experience uh, sexual pleasure from as young as four or five years of age. So when you think about the LGBT community, it is very important that we separate it from our brothers and sisters who are having same-sex attraction and who are involved in same-sex relationships, who are Christians like us, who are also struggling like we are doing with adultery and many other issues. They are not part of the community. The community is an organized group. They can join that community or they can remain in church. So when it comes to us as Christians, then the question is, those of us who are struggling with same-sex relationships, those of us who are in same-sex relationships, how are we dealing with them? And that is what would make the difference as to which place they would go to. Uh, I would just like to say this. Um, I had great challenges with culture and the Christian faith. And uh, there is a time I left church because I was saying the, the Muzungu came with this God. We had a God that we believed in, and we knew God even before the, the, the Muzungu came. And why is it that I must go to this uh, Muzungu God? And I had a lot of challenges with, with culture and faith. And um, eventually, we met someone when my, my, one of my friends' was, uh, daughter was getting married. And we invited uh, a gentleman to come and speak to us about our African culture and how it should relate to Christian faith. And uh, you also know, those of you who are in central province, that there's a lot of movement about people going back to the Kikuyu culture and bringing back a lot of stuff that had been uh, disappeared. And the gentleman came and gave us three categories from whatever culture you're coming to, to Christ. You need to take your culture and divide it into three important categories. Category number one is what is it in your culture where you are coming from that is not offensive to the teaching of Christ and that culture you can keep. So for me, so the, the, how do you name your children? We name them after our parents. That is not offensive to Christian life, so that you can keep. The second category are things that are well-intentioned, but whose practice would offend the Christian faith. So the, the, the Kikuyus, just like the Luos, used to inherit wives. If, if somebody died uh, with a young uh, widow, with little children, then a man would be identified who would then be the father of that home. Now, it is a good thing that the children are not disinherited, that the mother has somebody to consult when the children need a fatherly figure. But then... If you have sexual relations with that woman, then you will be offending uh, the Christian doctrine. 
So for those kind of cultures, you modify them. You keep what is good and you reject that which is not uh, in keeping with Christian faith. Then there are those cultural practices that are offensive to Christian teaching. And here would have maybe polygamy uh, and uh, what um, blood sacrifice. So the Kikuyu is used to slaughter an animal and give it as a sacrifice to God. We would call on spirits and others. And Christ then became the last and final sacrifice. We do not need to sacrifice animals to God. So for those kind of practices, you reject them. So anybody who is coming to Christ from the LGBT movement, who has been told that all the things that they have done in brokenness is normal and they should not apologize to anyone, when they come to Christ, then they must look at all those practices in that community and decide and see this I can keep, this I must reject, this I can keep, this I can't, I must reject, so that we, we are clear that I have come to Christ as a Kikuyu, I am a Christian of Kikuyu extraction, I am a Christian of LGBT extraction, I am a Christian of Luo extraction, I am a Christian of contemporary, from the contemporary culture. Whichever way we come to Christ, there are things that we can keep, there are things we must modify, and there are things that we must reject. Remember, as you're sharing photos and your thoughts, the hashtag is Let's Talk. You can continue sending in your questions. We can't answer all the questions for you today, but uh, on Friday, we will definitely answer some of those questions. There's a question here. What about the intersex child? Yes, uh, again, um, if you look at the, 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 the um, abbreviations, uh, LGBTQ sometimes has an I. Now, the I um, is the intersex child. And the reason why we need to understand the intersex child is because this is a child who has been uh, born with um, a disorder of sex development. So when we're in our mother's womb, our gonads are basically neutral. They're not male or female. Until the Y chromosome kicks in, you produce testosterone. Testosterone would then, uh, the, gonad, no, the, the gene would convert the gonads into testes. Those would produce testosterone. And testosterone would then change the physical structure and the way the brain develops so that you get a male child. If the Y chromosome is not there, then the natural development is feminine. So sometimes you find that that doesn't kick in or kicks in halfway. And when the baby is born, we as gynecologists and midwives simply look between the legs and we tell the mother is a boy, it's a girl. For this particular child, it becomes impossible. They are born with what we call ambiguous genitalia. So you look at the child, you're not sure whether they are boys or girls. And it becomes very difficult to give that child uh, a biological sex. Now, it would then mean you'd have to give them a sex of a bringing. So you do genetic studies, you do hormonal studies, you do ultrasounds, and you still can't tell whether they are boys or girls. And you say, let us raise them as boys, or let us raise them as girls. But when adolescence comes, and the secondary sexual characteristics start developing, then you start finding now changes that give us the definitive biological sex. So majority, many of them would be brought up as girls. They would go to girls', school, to girls schools. And then when uh, puberty kicks in, their, their chest start broadening. They get this deep voice. And majority, some of them are actually accused of being lesbians because the girls tend to be very attracted to them. And you know there, there is a lot of um, stuff yeah. happening. Yeah. And um, at that point, then we now know that this is not a girl, it's a boy, and even they know that there is something that is not right. That child needs to be transitioned from a girl's school to a, uh, either a mixed school or a boy's school, and then they would need to have their name changed, they would need to have their IDs and all those certificates corrected. Now, they are very unique children, uh, and because of that disability, the LGBT community is very interested in them because they have a legal right 
to change their sex of birth. Mm. You understand? Mm. Now, if that window can be exploited, then the transgenders would be able to have a legal mechanism to also claim change of name. So it is very important we understand that the intersex child is a child living with a disability of sex development and that that child needs to have a mechanism in law where once a, sexual, a secondary sexual characteristics develop and the final biological sex is identified, then we allow them to transition and quickly uh, mingle and, and, and fit into society. And the main thing is to preserve their, their, um, their reproductive capacity for those who may actually have. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Tari. As we wind up, Kuri, I want to ask you um, just the last question. We could tell from the passion that you have that you have clearly studied uh, media and the trends and how they shape narratives. What are some of the critical lessons um, that you have learned that you can share with us and even some that probably as a church we do need to adopt? That's a great question. I, I just want to th slide in one thing under the door before I answer your question. <laughs> if you, will you have me. one minute <laughs> to slide and answer my question. What I, what, I, what I didn't mention earlier is the three media frontiers now that uh, the GLAD and the, the, the gay rights lobbies have in terms of media are one, advertising. Advertising is about to change in North America. If you Google a thing called the Visibility Project, Procter & Gamble, P&G, have just invested a million dollars uh, in the Visibility Project because what, what they say is that they're not represented in advertising. So look out for advertising in the next two, three years and see how it begins to change. That's one of the critical ones. Mm. Second one is kids programming. Kids programming has already begun to change yeah. significantly. Mm. Uh, some of you may know that Batman at some point was supposed to become a gay character um, in the past couple of years. There was a bit of uproar about that and what they did is they, they changed it to Batwoman who became a lesbian character. Um, who became a lesbian character. If you watch Steven's Universe on Cartoon Network, if you, you know, there are all these different shows. I think they'll, they'll be up on the screen. The Loud House, DuckTales, She-Ra, which I grew up, anyone grew up watching She-Ra or He-Man? Yeah. Yeah. Shira, who's now a lesbian character. So kids programming is the second one. And the third one is social media. Uh, so that's, this is a very interesting one. And again, you can Google the GLAD social media index because they keep track of, of what's happening on social media. GLAD have pretty much said that all social media is unsafe for the LGBT community. Interesting, because what that means is it means that there are people who don't agree Many people on, on, the social, on social media platforms across the world. However, the, the amount of pressure being put on Facebook, being put on YouTube, I can guarantee you, take my word to the bank, if this video is uploaded to YouTube, at some point it will be flagged and brought down as hate speech, without a doubt. So these are the three frontiers that we are kind of heading into. Uh, kids program, advertising, and uh, what did I say? and social media. So watch out for these in the next couple of years and begin to see the subtle changes that happen there. Now to your question. Yes. What Half are the lessons? Minute. My wife asked me one day, she said to me, and she's here, what if, what if our son came up, to, came up to us one day and said, Dad, I'm gay? And, uh, you know, we paused for a moment to think through what that's like, because I know many parents, and possibly some of them seated here or watching on television, kind of go through this. And I, I thought to myself, first thing is to love him with all my heart. He'd be, he's my son still, and I think that's, that's how we need to look at people, whether they're our biological kids or not, to love them with all our hearts, like Jesus would call, to, would call us to love people. But to be courageous enough to be able to say to them, this is what I think. You know, for me, the lesson I've learned is just the power of media in shaping our perceptions and changing our perceptions. There's an image I came across years ago that I absolutely love. Can you put this image of the apple on the screen? I love this image because what it shows you is that the reflection, whoever has placed this apple, they'll show you the parts of the narrative that they want you to see. 
And, and that's how sales works or marketing works. We'll show you the part of it that we want you to see. But the question I ask myself is, are we being sold what may eventually turn out to be a broken narrative? Mm. This narrative is so well stage managed that I don't know if it can hold together for too many years. At some point, I suspect from a media perspective, the narrative will break down. Let me read, let me read to you a couple of things I, I discovered in my research from completely secular organizations across the world. And you will tell me what, what you think about this. Psychology Today says this, same-sex couples reported shorter relationship lengths than heterosexual couples. That's psychology today, not a Christian organization at all. Pride Legal. Pride Legal is actually an LGBT publication. And they say gay marriage has a higher divorce rate than any other. This is an interesting one. The Office of National Statistics in the UK. This is a huge body in the UK that manages statistics. So the Kenya Bureau of Statistics, I assume. See this. Lesbian couples are two and a half times more likely to get divorced. Two and a half times. This is the statistics that they have gathered through the years. A lady called Sarah Nilsson, PhD, who's done some incredible research in this area, says two things. That gay men were two to three times more likely to have concurrent sexual partners than any other group. And finally, the CDC, another huge organization uh, in the U.S., and we've heard, we've heard about them because of COVID and things like that. They're the Center for Disease Control, because remember, this becomes a public health issue. Say this. Oh, sorry, there's a second thing that Sarah Nelson said that I forgot to mention. She said that gay men, at the time of this research, accounted for 2% of the U.S. population, but 59% of new HIV and 62% of early syphilis cases in the US. The Center for Disease Control said this. They estimate uh, that HIV and early syphilis rates among gay men are 40 times higher than within the heterosexual community. What I think, what I learned from this as someone who studies media and trends is I have to ask myself how much of our perception is being impacted by media and by narrative. I'll close, because I, I, again, I know I've spoken for long, I'll close with a passage of scripture. I have so many more examples, I wish I had more time to be able to break them. It's a fascinating, fascinating topic. But I'll close the passage of scripture. It's in Proverbs 7, and it says this. This is Solomon speaking, and he really represents the voice of God to humanity today. He says, my son, keep my words and store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And to insight, you are my relative. What Solomon is saying here in the first part of this proverb, he's saying, listen to what God has said. Listen to the things that the eternal God of yesterday, today, and the one who understands the trends of tomorrow says in scripture. And I know Pastor Andrach is going to bring that up in a bit. But listen to the second part of this and the final part as I, as I close my thoughts. Solomon, the wisest man, is standing on the balcony and he sees something happening and this is what he says. At the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice. I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth, a young man who had no sense. He was going down the street near her corner, a prostitute's corner, walking along in the direction of her house. Verse 10 says, Then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute, with crafty intent and with persuasive words. And if you read the, the proverb, you'll see the persuasive words she says. My husband is away. I have fulfilled my vows. Come. And then she says, Come. This is the narrative I hear with, with sexual revolution. Let's drink deeply of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. And this is the narrative I hear even with the LGBT movement. It's about love. Choose who you love. Love the way that you want. Let's drink deeply. But he closes by saying this. 
With persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. All at once he followed her, like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose, till an arrow pierced his liver, and like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. What I suspect with this narrative is that it's going to break down at some point, and we are going to lose a generation who have drunk deeply of love, and who have put aside some of the things that God says. And for me, as I think about my son, I told my wife this. I said, you know what? I'd have to love him with everything I have. I'd have to let him know that he's my son and that I care for him. But I care about his life. And I don't want a narrative to change his thinking and lead him to a place where ultimately he loses his life. Thank you very much, Daktari, and thank you, Kuria. It's interesting, Daktari, you started by talking about love and you've ended on the same note. And we really appreciate you. Um, and I'm looking forward to learn some more again in the second service. If you do want to stay, you're welcome to stay. A round of applause for our speakers as they take a seat.